The following is a not-for-profit fan-based adaptation. Fire Emblem, Fire Emblem Awakening, and all related terminology are owned by Nintendo and Intelligent Systems. This is a work of fanfiction and love. Please, don't sue us. Fire Emblem Awakening, Invisible Ties, Episode 2 Crom woke with a start. The momentary panic of waking in a strange new place setting in until he remembered where he was. With a sigh, he shook the last of the sleep out of his mind. The campfire had long since burned itself out, the embers offering little illumination to the night, and moonlight pierced through the canopy of leaves they were camped under, illuminating small patches of the forest floor around them. The newest member of their little group was resting on his side, arm being used as a pillow on the opposite side of the fire. Robin had insisted that the night had been warm enough, and even then he had his thick coat to keep him warm. Crom sat watching the sleeping stranger for a moment. After their shared meal, Robin had impressed the three shepherds with a surprising amount of tactical knowledge that seemed to spring up out of the amnesiac's mind almost instantly. He, Crom, and Frederick had spoken at length on the subject, Robin demonstrating a keen mind as Lyssa sat quietly and looked on uncomprehendingly. He was already formulating a way to ask the man to serve as the shepherd's official tactician. Gods knew they sorely needed one, not to mention the man was skilled with a blade and a mage as well. No, Naga sent you to us for a reason. Interrupting Crom's musings on the future of his little troop, something in the forest caught his attention. A sound, almost like ripping fabric. Quietly, so as not to wake the others, Crom stood and took up his broadsword, Falcian. The divine blade Falcian had served him well since his father had passed during his youth. He and the blade had been nigh inseparable. Crom squinted into the dark as the sound repeated louder and closer this time. He took two steps before Lyssa stirred, sitting up and mumbling sleepily. <sighs> Crom, where are you going? Nowhere, sister. Just going for a walk. Well, let me come with you. I'm stiff from sleeping on the ground. Uh, don't worry about it. Just get some sleep. Well, I'm awake now. Yes, you always did wake up in an instant. As opposed to someone who doesn't wake up at all unless Frederick rides his horse over him? <sighs> well, come on if you're coming. Wait. What? What's wrong? There's no birds. It's too quiet. What happened to all the animals? <laughs> Crom, what was that? I don't know. Ah! The ground suddenly shook. A violent upheaval that almost managed to throw Crom flat. As Lyssa grabbed hold of her brother to avoid falling over, the trees waved wildly, some even falling with loud crashes, uprooted completely by the quake. All Crom could think was that this was wrong. The southern region of Elise never suffered from earthquakes. Further up north, near the border, they were commonplace, but never of this magnitude. Crom looked up, his eyes widening as he beheld the fiery light of ruin. Lyssa, run. The girl looked up at her brother, confused for a moment, before she saw what he saw, dread settling in the pit of her stomach as her face became illuminated in the darkness. Racing towards them was a wall of fire, tearing up the ground and burning the forest as it went. Trees twice as big around as some of the columns in the Grand Hall of the Elysian Palace went flying from the flames, as smaller fireballs fell from the sky ahead of the wave causing destruction where they landed. The earth itself groaned and split as the fire reached it, huge cracks forming and massive slabs of ground heaving upwards meters into the sky, the landscape altering around them in seconds. Run! As Crom shouted, he gave Lyssa a small shove to accentuate his point. They raced as fast as they could through the forest in an almost blind panic. Lyssa doing her best to keep up with the much faster Crom as he charged ahead. He veered to the left suddenly as a tree fell across their path, and Lyssa stumbled, catching herself quickly and pressing on. <sighs> <sighs> uh, what nightmare is this? I don't know! Keep running! Crom and Lyssa ran on, 
dodging trees as the ground quaked beneath his feet. With a great crash, the ground beneath Krom and Lissa jumped up, sending them sprawling in a clearing at the base of a newly formed cliff. Ah! Back at the little campsite, Robin snorted himself awake, looking around as he wiped the drool away from the corner of his mouth. The amnesiac found himself alone with a slumbering Frederick, the knights breathing calm and regular in the darkness. Robin stood, stretching his arms above his head and letting out a little groan. Crom? <sighs> Lissa? Ah! Robin fell flat on his back as the earth shifted and bounced beneath him, Frederick's horse whinnying and doing its best to escape the rope tying it to the tree. The horse's owner was on his feet instantly, even before the ground had stopped shaking. What's going on? Where's my lord and lady? How should I know? As the shaking stopped, Frederick dashed to his mount's side, already hefting the heavy saddle back into place. Robin was about to say something else, but stopped when the scent of smoke reached him. Instead, he stood and turned towards the forest, his face going slack. The night sky was ablaze, literally as flames danced through and above the forest. Just above them, Robin could make out a vaguely human shape, but he couldn't see more through the smoke and heat haze rising from the burning forest. Frederick, we need to find Krom and Lissa. Get on! Robin shrugged, jumping onto the horse with little effort and gripping the back of Frederick's plates. Without further warning, the big knight kicked his horse into motion, racing off towards the flames. Robin looked up again, straining his eyes to see if he could spot the human-shaped figure again, but the sky was empty. What's going on? Krom didn't answer, instead looking up in horror to the sky. The sky looked back, a giant, crystalline blue eye with a slit pupil like that of a snake or other reptile stared balefully down at the two shepherds. As the two looked on, speechless, forms began to coalesce in the eye, taking vaguely human shapes before reaching through its surface and falling twenty feet to the forest floor. With inhuman slowness and malice, the two dark forms picked themselves up. They were wearing identical dark leather armor and masks, glowing red eyes staring with hate from eye slits and black miasma leaking from joints in the suits. To Krom's further dismay, they both held large, wickedly sharp-looking axes. Lissa, stay behind me. Right. Falcon was reassuring in his grip as he rushed the first of the creatures, slashing horizontally in a blow that should have neatly bisected the creature. It simply grunted, more black fog pouring from the wound and swung its axe with impossible strength and speed. Krom caught the weapon on his blade, grunting with the effort. Ah! Acting quickly, he transferred his weight, throwing the monster back and striking its head with Falcon's pommel, before beheading it with his backswing. The monster turned to purple ash and smoke almost instantly, dissipating on the night wind. Ah! All of this had only taken a few seconds, but, as he turned to face the other foe, Krom heard his sister cry out. The other thing had crossed the distance faster than he had, and held its axe above its head, ready to strike. Lissa had fallen back, and held a tree branch in front of her defensively. Krom's gut lurched as he realized that he'd never crossed the distance in time. Lissa! Calling his sister's name, he tried anyway. Lissa screamed as the creature brought down the axe. Krom wasn't sure how, but instead of his sister, a new man had interposed himself between her and the creature, holding the axe away from his back with a broadsword balanced on his shoulder. Help me! Krom acted instantly, slashing horizontally again, beheading the creature as the other man rose, slashing the opposite direction at its waist, making it disappear into purple mist like the first had. The new man steadied himself, sheathing his broadsword and turning slightly away as he did. 
Crom was surprised to see the man was wearing an ornate blue mask with slits for eyes. Crom turned to the forest, spotting more of the creatures beginning to converge out of the woods. But, above the sound of more of the strange creatures, Crom could hear the welcome sound of a horse at full gallop charging through the trees. Crom spun, expecting to see Frederick riding to their rescue, but instead was met by a woman in white-edged red armor, large, muscular arms bare, swinging a lance left and right like a madwoman, the strange, shadowy creatures recoiling from her wrath. The silver-blue-haired, absurdly well-dressed man behind her was clinging one-handed to her waist like a drowning man to a life preserver, his bow held out in the other hand in an obvious attempt to try and maintain balance, all semblance of his usual dignity gone. The knight in red reined her horse in close to where Krom, Lyssa, and the masked stranger stood, allowing the archer to dismount and brandishing her lance at the encroaching creatures. Captain Krom! Sully? Good timing. All right, you ash-faced freaks, who wants some farts? And you said, stay at the barracks, this will be a quiet mission. This Terze, I'm never letting you or Frederick out of my sight again. I always miss all the fun. This is what you consider fun? There were at least two dozen of the creatures now, all sporting axes or swords and a few almost naked. Sallow-skinned creatures with elongated arms and cloth hoods armed with nothing but wicked-looking claws, all shambling like the dead. If the other two were any indication, though, the shambling gait wouldn't last. Their odds weren't good. Pick a god and pray! Crom re-evaluated their position as Frederick barreled through the crowd astride his warhorse like a bull charging a matador, Robin leaping from behind him as they came closer. Frederick shouted as he rode past, gesturing to the horde with one hand as he tossed Lissa's staff to her with the other. Without further prompting or comment, Sully leveled her lance and kicked her horse into action at the same time as Frederick, the two of them charging back through the creatures, capturing their attention immediately as they tore through the enemy ranks. Sully, with me! Hell yeah! Bring it! Well, that'll buy us some time. Are you okay? We're fine. As he spoke, Crom spared a still pale Lyssa a glance to be sure. She was standing her ground, staff clenched in shaking fists, but she nodded once to Crom. The masked man was standing shock still behind her, facing away and obviously evaluating the battlefield. Right then, Frederick and the other knight will clear the creatures and hit their back ranks. We push through the front, meet in the middle. Lissa, you and the archer stay back, but don't fall behind or let yourselves get separated from us. Crom, you, me, and Mr. Mask over there are front line. Everybody clear? Got it. Lead the way. Very well. The archer? Sir, I'll have you know that I am the archest of archers. I am Virion, the man who strides large across history's stage. Ruffles, can it? Make with the shooty shoot. Ruffles? I swooped to the rescue and in return am scoffed and scorned. Crom nodded, impressed by Robin's tactical mind. Barely a minute to evaluate the scene, even after all the destruction that had unnerved him so, and he had a plan. The masked man hesitated, almost looking about to object, before nodding assent, drawing his sword and turning to hide the bulk of the blade away from Crom and the others, a curious action that could wait for explanation later when strange creatures that had fallen out of the sky weren't trying to kill them all. All right, everyone. Ready? Yeah. Indeed. Krom stepped forward, readying Falcon and forming an ad hoc line with Robin and the masked stranger. The creatures had come much closer now, the momentary distraction of Sully and Frederick's charge forgotten, close enough that Krom could hear their ragged breathing and make out the details of their masks and hoods. The world seemed to slow to a stop as the two opposing forces faced each other, the creatures seemingly unsure of how to deal with a group that had so quickly gone from separate prey to a serious threat. With shouted battle cries, Frederick and Silly smashed into the back of their foes at full speed, scattering enemies or crushing them underfoot. Attack! Robin charged into the creatures, sword at the ready. Krom and the masked man followed instantly as Virion let loose his first arrow, 
dropping one of the creatures with a precision shot through the eyeslit of its mask. Lyssa stayed close to Virian, trying hard to be inconspicuous as they passed fallen creatures. Come on! <laughs> Krom hacked left and right, style and form quickly being lost in the general melee, creatures falling away from him as he went. Robin and the masked man were doing the same, slashing and hacking at creatures that came within range. Virion shooting a steady stream of arrows into the creatures, staggering them for the others to drop, or else simply dropping them himself with well-placed shots. <laughs> One of the creatures, bigger than the others, suddenly loomed above Robin, axe held high in challenge. Robin noticed the creature and reached into his pouch, producing the spellbook he had used earlier. With quick hand gestures, he sent three bolts of lightning at the creature, striking it squarely and piercing its leather armor, black mist pouring from the wounds. With a feral roar, the creature closed the last of the distance, swinging at Robin. The tactician was too slow moving from its path, taking a glancing blow on his side through the thick cloak he wore. He retreated a few steps, returning the spellbook to his pouch and readying his blade in a two-handed grip. Blows rained down on the tactician, forcing him back as he skillfully dodged or parried each attack. Suddenly, three arrows struck the creature in the chest and shoulder. How do you like that? Ruffles, behind us! That is not my name and you know it! Virian spun away at Lissa's warning, turning on the other creatures encroaching on them. Robin took the opportunity to duck below the creature's guard, stabbing upwards into its chest. The creature roared again, knocking Robin back with its free arm, sending the injured man sprawling, his blade still stuck fast in its chest. <laughs> the creature reached down with its free hand, and instead of pulling the sword out, snapped the blade off from where it protruded tossing the broken pommel and half the sword aside. Krom watched in desperate glances, risking himself by taking his eyes off his own opponents. The creatures before him simply wouldn't die, or when they did, they were replaced by even more of the identical things. A bit of help, please? Damn it, get out of my way! The larger creature was closing on Robin, obviously wounded but still shuffling menacingly almost like it was taking its time and savoring the coming kill. Krom's wild swings were rewarded when one of the axe-wielding creatures fell, turning to the familiar black mist, but the other sword-wielding creature before him pressed its attack with more of the inhuman speed and strength they seemed to possess. Hold on, Robin. Damn it, hurry up! Krom backpedaled, parrying desperately, sweat pouring down his face. The bigger creature had reached Robin, who was desperately crawling back from his foe, holding the wound in his side. The bigger creature stomped down hard on the tactician's chest, pinning him as it raised its axe, Robin crying out in pain. Robin! Before the creature could land the blow, the masked man was on it, swinging his sword upwards and severing its arm at the elbow arm and axe falling to the side in a stream of black mist before he pirouetted and cut the creature's head clean from its shoulders. The head fell to the forest floor, bouncing once before dissipating to mist. The other creatures became slower and seemed confused without their leader, and Krom cut down the sword-wielding one pressing in on him without any difficulty. Doing a quick once-over of the battlefield, Krom was glad to see that the last few of the creatures were being rounded up by Sully and Frederick, who weren't seeming to have any more difficulty with them. Krom ran to his new friend, who had sat up, but was coughing violently. <coughs> oh, that hurt! <coughs> that hurt so bad! <sighs> that thing was heavy! <laughs> Just sit back and bask in our victory. Both men glanced up as Lyssa and Virian approached. Lyssa set to work instantly with her staff, healing Robin's wounds. The tactician, for that was all Krom could think of him as now, sighed in relief as the healing magics did their work. 
it didn't take long before robin grumbled forcing himself to his feet as he complained uh, oh i'm basking all right i'm basking in playing the insect underfoot i will never step on another bug as long as i live he limped over to crom as sully and frederick returned to the clearing sully was covered in small wounds and nicks in her armor but frederick still looked resplendent like he was in a parade as he surveyed the battlefield that appears to be all of them my lord Woohoo! that was fun this is why i never stay in the barracks the only evidence of the creatures was the scattered and broken weapons lying about the creatures themselves had turned to mist and vanished once felled robin frederick and crom all turned on the masked man who was standing silently apart from the others even with the mask though it was plain that he was staring at crom so thanks for saving me the man nodded in robin's direction as lissa bounded over having just finished with sully's injuries me too i mean for saving me thanks for saving me you saved my sister's life and the life of my friend not to mention you stood by our sides and fought bravely against those things my name is crom may i ask yours you may call me marth marth as in the hero king of old well you certainly fight like a hero i'll grant you that where did you learn to handle a sword like that i'm not here to talk about me this world teeters at the edge of darkness what you saw tonight was merely a prelude to the greater disaster yet to come the warning has been delivered well that was strange you didn't see him fall out of the sky he fell out of the sky too not much for conversation is he his skills obviously lie elsewhere i have little doubt our paths will cross again we should make haste to ensure that the capital hasn't befallen the same fate as this forest. Well, what are we waiting for? With that, the tactician set off walking in a random direction, barely taking a few steps before stopping. On second thought, I have no idea where I'm going. Does somebody else want to lead? Great with tactics, obviously not so much with direction. <laughs> hey, wait up! I'm still wounded here! Robin limped lightly along beside Crom through the busy streets of Elistol, the capital city of Elise, and apparently where the shepherds were based. His ribs still sore from the battle that morning despite Lissa's best efforts. The streets were packed, but the air in the city was one of everyday life, rather than the fear and panic they had been expecting. Despite their initial relief though, Crom had still set a punishing pace through the city towards the palace. Well, everything looks okay at least. <sighs> yes, thank Naga. He, Krom, Lissa, and Frederick were off to the palace with the intention of warning the local ruler. Virian and Sully were returning to the shepherd's barracks somewhere in the city. Virian was still doing his best to chat the young knight up the entire way. Robin listening in until their voices faded into the crowd. The tactician definitely respected Virian's daring and commitment. Elistol was a massive, sprawling city. The buildings had eventually spilled from within the high walls of the original castle town, and many different wards and residential districts expanded around the circular wall in all directions. The crowd became thinner as they entered the more wealthy area of the city near its heart. They passed a grand cathedral, a towering building with four large bell towers that Robin somehow knew without memory was a church dedicated to the divine dragon, Naga. In the near distance, Robin could see the towers of the Exalt's palace rising above the surrounding buildings now, Pegasi coming and going from the largest of the towers, which was obviously where their roost was. So, who is this Exalt? Should I be aware of any courtly manner things that might get me executed for screwing up? <laughs> what? No, nothing like that. Exalt Emerin is a kind-hearted ruler. She'd more than likely sit you down and explain the rules of the court to you than have you executed. I've been on the receiving end of one of those, though, and execution might be the preferable option to that boredom. She cares about her subjects more than any other ruler we've ever had, our father included. She sounds truly benevolent. Yeah, and she's the best big sister anyone could ever ask for. Yeah, I'm sure she would be. Wait. Did, did you say big sister and father? You mean you and Krom are... 
Yes, we're the prince and princess of Elise. Wheels turned in his head for a few seconds as Robin tried to process this unexpected information, deciding on automatically dropping to one knee, head held low as he begged for forgiveness. I, I, I am so sorry. Please forgive my dreadful manners. <laughs> <laughs> you mean to tell us that you remember my lord's name, but not his title? Please, Robin. M isn't the only one that hates courtly manners and the like. I'm just crumb to you. Come on. We shouldn't linger. M needs to hear about what happened last night. If you say so. They were met at the great oak doors to the main hall by an older man in plate armor similar to Frederick's, but much more ornate, with a blue tabard over the top depicting what Robin assumed to be the symbol of Elise, and a matching blue cape fanned out behind him. He had a great red beard which was on its way to gray, and a receding hairline pulled back into a ponytail that hung to the collar of his armor. Robin didn't doubt that he was probably one of the most deadly warriors he'd ever come face to face with, judging merely from the way he held himself. The knight commander greeted the two seriously, offering a nod to Frederick. Prince Krom, Princess Lyssa, welcome home. Please follow me. The exalt is waiting for you. Well met, Cullen. Please, lead the way. Krom fell into stride beside the man, Frederick close behind. Robin followed, feeling ignored, Lyssa matching his speed as the tactician looked around in wonder. The great hall lived up to its name. It was a cavernous space with a ceiling that seemed to reach the heavens, held up by great carved marble pillars, each intricately detailed with mosaics of Elysian royalty and victories. Paintings and statues lined the walls, and in the center of the hall, reaching almost to the ceiling, was a massive statue of what Robin assumed to be the hero king, Marth. The statue stood, staring benevolently into the distance, sword held point down at rest in front of him. The beautiful throne at the end of the hall sat empty, the exalt no doubt waiting for them further inside the palace. That's the knight commander. He served our father during the war with Plegia and watched over us when we were children after father died. He also commands the ground forces in the Elysian army, which is split equally down the middle between ground and aerial units, because Pegasi breeds so well in Elise. The leader of the aerial group is- Wing Commander Phyla! Cullen called out in greeting to a stern-looking woman in lighter armor standing at the rear of the great hall. Her armor was a deep, polished bronze color, ornate like Cullen's. She was a slight woman much smaller than her male counterpart, obviously a veteran flyer from her lighter armor and bowed legs. She bowed slightly from the waist in greeting to the prince and princess, before ushering the group into a smaller back room, giving Robin a curious look. Robin simply shrugged and followed Crom and Lyssa, Frederick behind them. Cullen led them through a series of passageways, past more soldiers wearing variations on Cullen's or Phyla's armor, the knight commander leading, the wing commander taking rearguard. It was a sound strategy, Robin noted, and bespoke of lifetime soldiers that slipped into battlefield tactics off the field out of habit. At one point they had to press themselves against the wall as a squad of Pegasi knights trooped past in full battle kit. They passed by, the others of their group waiting patiently, Cullen explaining to Crom that they were sending scout parties out to watch the Plegian borders. Eventually, the group was led into one of the royal apartments. It was a comfortable sitting room, not at all like Robin had been expecting. Soft-looking couches sat around a low table with a crystal pitcher of water and a bowl of fresh fruit on it, and bookshelves lined one wall, all crammed to bursting. A fireplace sat empty on the wall opposite the shelves, but it looked as clean and well-maintained as the rest of the palace had. Lyssa flopped onto one of the couches in a relaxed, unprincess-like manner as Crom sat with a relieved sigh and helped himself to some of the water. Frederick and Phyla stood flanking the door they had come through, all military precision. Robin couldn't help but feel like he stood out. Crom glanced up at the tactician standing awkwardly in the doorway and offered him a grin. I told you not to worry, Robin. She's not as scary as all the knights in the big palace make her seem. Hmm. I am so out of place here. 
Believe me when I say, I feel the exact same way. This was my parents' apartment once. I have fond memories of sitting in front of that fireplace with them when I was younger. My father would read us stories while my mother would teach M to sew. They were better times. At least you have memories. My oldest memory is thinking, gee, that girl is loud a day and a half ago. I heard that. Luckily, before Krom could slip into further memories, Cullen opened the doors opposite from the ones Phyla and Frederick stood at, both of whom snapped to attention. Presenting Her Grace, Exalt Emerin I of House Elise. Emerin strode gracefully out of the other room, her cream and beige robes rustling regally as she moved, long blonde hair not unlike Lissa's done up in braids and plates that framed her face. She was definitely related to the other two, seemingly combining the best features of Krom's and Lissa's faces for her own. The thing that Robin noticed most, though, was the symbol on her forehead, the color of scar tissue, the same symbol on Krom's bare shoulder and central to the Elysian coat of arms that he had seen all over the palace. He resolved to ask someone about it when he got the chance. Please, Cullen. We're all friends here. There's no need for formalities. Sorry, Your Grace. <clears throat> Force of habit. M. Hello, Lissa. I trust camping with Crom and Frederick was fun? Yeah, well, it was until the whole attacked by monsters thing happened. It's okay. There will be a war council as soon as this greeting is over to determine how best to deal with this new threat. Hello, Em. Emerin smiled at her brother as he approached and gave her a quick, one-armed hug. The prince slightly taller than her, Robin noticed, before she turned on the tactician. Cullen, too, seemed to take note of Robin for the first time, and his bushy eyebrows shot up in surprise. I do not believe we have met. This is Robin. We found him... Uh, well, we found him passed out in a field, with amnesia. However, he's fought valiantly by our sides to see us return to Elistol, and has earned my respect with his martial skills and knowledge of tactics. In fact, I intended to ask him to be the Shepherd's official tactician after the War Council. Your Grace. Wait, what? Tactician! Your Grace, I feel it necessary to point out that we know nothing about this man besides his name, and that he claims to have no knowledge of his past. We cannot rule out the idea that he may be a foreign spy. Hmm. Do you trust this man, Krom? I do, sister. Then that is enough for me. But we really must prepare for the council. Well, we should get out of the way. What with the war council and all? You all have fun! Lyssa all but dragged Robin, who was still trying to process what Krom had said, to the doors, which Frederick opened for them, scowling at Robin. Through the closing doors, Robin could see Emerin holding a hand to her mouth in an attempt to stifle her laughter, while Krom smiled and shook his head. <sighs> oh, thank Naga you were here to get me out of there. I hate war councils. They're so boring. Tactician. Tactician. Anyway, let me show you the Shepherd's Barracks. It's not far from the palace. Tactician. The barracks were a few blocks away from the palace district near the city wall, surrounded by what Robin assumed were the other barracks for the Elysian army proper. Obviously, what Robin had seen in the palace were just the royal guard. Judging from the amount of soldiers, Elise was indeed a martial state, like Krom had said. The shepherds' barracks and stables were side by side as Robin had guessed earlier. Sully was in the stables, brushing down her horse, and spared them a very girlish wave as they passed, looking entirely out of place on her muscular frame. Robin waved back, wondering if Virian had finally given up his pursuit of love for the day. They entered the squat barracks building, and Robin looked around, almost disappointed by how simple the place seemed. Rooms along the back with four cots apiece a kitchen area, an area to store weapons and armor, and a simple common area, occupied by Virian and four other strangers eating various forms of lunch. Virian was reclining casually, a teacup in one hand hovering above the saucer in the other, still dressed in his exceedingly fine battlewear, ruffles and all. The archest of archers nodded in greeting to Robin as he and Lyssa approached the group. Hi, everyone! Ah, my friends. Welcome back. How was the palace? Boring, stuffy, dreary. 
The usual. I thought it was quite fancy. Try living in it. One of those eating lunch, a prissy-looking blonde dressed similarly to Lissa, but in pink riding clothes of fine quality and looking about the same age, leapt up, running to Lissa and barging Robin bodily out of the way, grasping both of Lissa's hands in her own. A tanned, shirtless man with spiky blonde hair and chiseled muscles stood, walking over to them as well. Lissa, my treasure! Are you all right? I have been on pins and needles waiting for word of your safety. I'm fine, Maribel. I can handle a battle or two, you know. You worry too much. I did eat a bear, though. Hey, Squirt. Where's Crumb? You guys keep running off and having all the fun without the rest of us. I didn't think he'd be able to handle himself with that old Teach there to bail him out. Oh, it's Teach now, is it? Here, I was thinking you had to be born without brain. But you can teach it? Don't be underestimating teach. Hey. Wait, was that an insult? Before the teasing of the tanned man could continue, a slight brunette woman standing to the back stepped forward. Something about her screamed timidity and inexperience to Robin, but she was still wearing light bronze-colored Pegasus Rider armor, so he assumed she had at least some skill. Beg pardon, but... When can I see the captain? Poor Sumia. She's been absolutely beside herself with concern. Her eyes never left the horizon, waiting with bated breath in hopes of seeing you and your brother. Aw, that's so sweet. Well, I... that is... he's our captain, so I... Uh, am the prince, so of course I was worried. <laughs> <laughs> so, who's the new guy? Oh, right. Allow me to introduce Robin, the shepherd's new tactician. You should see all the awesome tricks he has up those sleeves. Oh yeah? Can he do this? <laughs> <laughs> I can see you have much to teach me in the arts of belching, oh illustrious teach. In any case, it's a pleasure to meet all of you. Vulgar. Ugh. Vake, that was abhorrent. Must you baseborn oafs pollute even the air with your buffoonery? And you, Robin... Do not encourage his behavior. I had hoped you were cut from finer cloth. With a self-righteous huff, Maribel stomped out of the shepherd's barracks. Definitely don't like her. Don't take her behavior to heart. She warms to people slowly. Or burns too quickly. <laughs> Here I thought she was just a prissy snob. The tactician smiled. He definitely liked Vake's attitude. Virian snickered lightly too, obviously having overheard. Robin jumped slightly as he noticed a fifth man sitting at the table with them in heavy armor, heavier even than Frederick's. He held out his hand with a big smile on his face, his bearing non-threatening despite the heavy armor. Hi, I'm, uh, I'm Kellum. Uh, hi? The shepherd spoke about inconsequential things as they waited for Crom's return, Lyssa and Robin filling the others in on the attack on the village by Plegian bandits and the encounter in the forest with the strange creatures, Virian occasionally interjecting on the latter with points and facts that Robin was surprised to admit were pretty observant. They talked about the shepherd's numbers and skills, filling Robin in on who he would be working with. Apparently there were a number of other part-time shepherds he had yet to meet. They sat and talked for a long time, Lyssa making light sandwiches for herself and Robin, who realized how hungry he was as she did. They had skipped breakfast, after all. Maribel had come back in long enough to say goodbye to Sumia and Lyssa, pointedly ignoring the males in the room. Vake stuck his tongue out at her back as she left. Sully joined them after a time, removing her armor, revealing the beige riding clothes that she wore underneath, and sitting as far away from Virian as possible. Where's Muriel, anyways? Probably holed up in the Royal Library, nose buried in some book. Ignoring the rest of us again. Probably wouldn't hurt you to do a little reading. So, when is Crumb getting here? Teach is itching for some action. Well, you should have come with me last night, then. We kicked ass! Teach is fit, but he can't keep up with your horse. And Ruffles was hogging the back seat. My name is Virian Oaf. Virian. Even someone as dimwitted as you should be able to get it right. 
Naga saved me from the nobility. Well, we would have been toast without this guy. Indeed. Uh, come on, guys. I didn't do all that much. All I did was get stepped on. Don't sell yourself short. We wouldn't have made out so well without your tactical advice. Ah! Captain! I was... I mean, we were... Everyone looked up at once as the prince walked through the door, looking tired. Lissa and Sumia jumped up, Vake leaning backwards to look at him upside down. As Sumia hurried over to Krom, her foot caught something on the floor, and Robin cringed as she face-planted with a loud thunk. <laughs> she pushed herself back up quickly, blushing heavily as she dusted herself off. Ouch. Sumia! Are you okay? Those boots still bothering you? The Pegasus Rider nodded awkwardly as Krom reached down, taking her chin and gently forcing her to look up at him as he inspected her face to make sure she wasn't hurt. Robin looked on with an eyebrow raised, Vake making what could only be described as silent kissy faces from his position upside down in the chair. Krom seemed to remember where he was, stepping back and blushing slightly. At least you're not hurt. Our orders, Captain? Uh, ah, right. <clears throat> At first light tomorrow morning, we march for Ragnaferox to petition the Khan for soldiers. Uh, Ragnaferox? Elisa's northern neighbor, a unified nation of barbarian tribes that dwell in the mountains. They have an official military alliance with Yalise, so we usually include them whenever we march to war. The others seemed satisfied with these orders, activity breaking out as they began to make their preparations. Sumia had accepted Robin's story about losing his memory instantly and without question, going out of her way to explain the history behind whatever the others were talking about to him. It was refreshing. After Frederick's behavior, he had been worried the others would react the same way. But, apparently, Lissa's good word was enough to get around that, as no one else hassled him about his memory. Well, Vake had asked a series of vulgar, personal questions about whether he had any memories of sexual experiences, earning a slap in the back of the head from Sully, but no serious hassles. Typically, the Exalt would go to make this request in person, but given the current political climate, the Council felt it was best for her to remain in Elise. They're worried the people might panic, so we've been given the duty instead. Now, this mission is strictly voluntary. I'll not force anyone to- I volunteer! Me too! Just try to ditch me again! I dare ya! I'm in! I suppose I should accompany you. It would probably aid your cause to have a certain modicum of nobility with you. Can't let you charge off without your new tactician now, can I? I was hoping you'd accept my offer. Ah, how could I refuse when you asked me in front of all the Elysian military leaders? Not to mention the Exalt herself! Call it incentive. I, uh, I, um, I'd like to come along too. But I don't feel, I mean, I don't think I'm quite ready for combat yet. I'll probably just get in the way. You can just keep to the rear and watch us. But there will come a time when you'll need to be ready to fight, Sumia. Just stay close to me and you'll be fine. Yes, of course! I mean, yes, Captain! Great, I'm barracked up with a bunch of lovesick teenagers. <laughs> The soldiers made their preparations, readying armor and weapons as the afternoon turned to evening and Lyssa and Virian set about making dinner. A princess that makes dinner for the soldiers. Don't need memories to know that that's unusual. Robin had opted to sit and take a closer look at the spellbook he had found in his pouch. With some quick comparisons to the thunder spell he had been able to pick up on so quickly, he was able to figure out how to read the rest of the spells. The tactician made some small notes on an extra piece of parchment Sully had found for him, and was interested to note that the entire book was in his own handwriting. Judging by some of the more complex spells towards the end, he had been quite the accomplished mage before his memories failed him. There were still a few that he couldn't understand beyond the titles at the top of the page, though. Flux, Nosferatu, Waste, Goetia. Something about those four spells, separate from the rest of the book, felt sinister to Robin. He decided that he didn't necessarily need them, and focused more on the lightning magic he obviously had an affinity for, going over his scrawled notes on a page for a complex spell called Mjolnir. His notes said something about Hammer of the Gods, but his handwriting was atrocious. 
no way he'd be able to perform it any time soon, though perhaps with enough practice. Robin was practicing the hand movements for the spell when Krom's shadow fell over him. I have a present for you. Robin marked the Mjolnir page, setting down the spellbook and standing, taking the sword and drawing it from the deep blue scabbard. It was smaller than Krom's broadsword, but just as elegant. A thin-bladed rapier with a beautifully sculpted golden knuckle bow and hilt. The blade, slightly thicker than the average rapier, Robin noted, again having no idea how he knew, gleamed in the light from the various oil lamps, and Robin could see his reflection in it. It was a weapon fit for a prince. It was given to me to train with, but I prefer to spend my time mastering Falcon. I uh, figured you could get some use out of it. Krom, this, this blade is... it's too much. I can't take this. Consider it an apology for dumping the whole tactician thing on you. I want you to keep it. Robin nodded, giving the blade a few practice sweeps. The others noticed and stopped to watch, Sully wolf-whistling appreciatively as Robin stepped away from Krom and began running some light drills. The rapier was perfectly balanced and Robin had no problem running the drills that came to him automatically. Robin nodded, sheathing the sword. The other shepherds all burst into applause. Apparently, Robin had made a good impression. Told you he could use a sword. Looking good, man! Well then, your highness, I accept your apology. Please don't call me that. Consider it a royal decree. Soon after, they all retired to bed, the girls in one room. Krom in a room of his own, and Robin sharing with Vake, Kellum, and Virion. They would have to be up early in the morning to march, and Robin was looking forward to some actual rest. That was before Vake started snoring. <sighs> so much for sleep. Maybe I'd be more comfortable in the stables?